Jennifer! How are you? Awesome. How are you? I'm fabulous. And just so nice to see me. I'm sitting in the Vatican. Where are you sitting? I'm sitting in my office. <laughs> okay. Well, this is my office. The huh? Vatican over my shoulder. Aww. When I speak like Il Papa. We're supposed to be there in March, darn it. Mi dispiace. Mm. Rome's not going anywhere. <laughs> well, knock on wood. All right. So, for fans um, of the flip side and our research together, I had a couple of people weigh in about last week's podcast saying that I was interrupting you, not letting you speak, uh, you know, interrupting the people on the flip side. What else is new? But I thought, if we can, let's ask Luana, did any of our guests want to continue on the conversation from last week? Mm -mm, I'm not no. getting it. <laughs> okay, very good, Lou. So today I thought we would invite somebody who we talked about last week at the very end of our session we had a very controversial comment come out of somebody from the flip side. Um, no other way to put it, accusing a particular person of being a participant or somehow involved with the death of a number of people. Right, of um, a Kennedy, correct? Yeah, that it was, because the question was, who was responsible for Robert Kennedy's death? And this person we were talking to said, or put in your mind's eye a picture of LBJ. And the internet went down and we came back up and then I had to, I wanted to ask, you know, were you completely responsible, sir, or partially responsible? And his response was- Indirectly. Indirectly, thank you, that's more accurate. But would you like to come and speak with us today, sir? Yeah, I guess he's here. Okay, Luana, sorry, I'm gonna, go ahead. I'm sorry, L, are you talking about Lyndon Johnson? Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ. He called everything LBJ, he had a dog, a little eagle, <laughs> Johnson. Uh, funny guy, unusual cat, but we're not here to judge anybody. We're here to explore these conversations on the other side. You show, you show me the Vietnam War, okay? Okay. And he's... He's saying the Vietnam War caused a lot of things to happen. I'm not okay. quite... All right. Well, sir, if I may, I will direct this uh, interview to you. And Luana, please adjust any questions or comments. I have two guests I'd like to come bring forward. I'd like Martin Luther King to come forward and be with us to correct any of the record. And Robert Kennedy, would you also, these are two people we've spoken to in our class, could they also participate? Would that be okay? <laughs> they already knew it was going to happen, yes. Okay, very good. So, Luana, let's sure. ask LBJ, who was there to greet you when you crossed over, sir? <laughs> His dog. His Just dog. I'm like, is hey. it because you mentioned that earlier? You know how my mind works. And he's like, no, my dog. And then good. he said he had All a right. lot of but um, I'm sorry, say it again. Said he had a lot of them, but okay. okay. His father. His father. Okay, very yeah. good. His father. And, and he didn't have a good relationship, he says, with his dad. So, what was that like for you to encounter him on the other side? Did you see him as a young man, as an old man? It's interesting because he says he saw him at the same age as himself. I see. So roughly the same age. Do you want to put in Jennifer's mind about what age you passed away? 
I got 78, but I have no idea. Okay. I felt like he had heart issues and he passed away earlier. Like, and then I got 64. So I don't know if he died. 64, 64. is actually, is accurate. Thank okay. you. Okay. So just for people tuning in, well, Jennifer exactly. didn't know that we were 64. Okay. For people but, tuning. Sorry, real fast. Was it 1964 that he passed away or was it? No, 19 he was 64 years old. He passed away in, I want to say, I, 73, something like that. Okay. But I, I just for the people tuning in, this is how we work together. I ask questions. If she's absolutely right on the money, accurate, she gets the answer. I try to help her unpack it. At, yes, he died at 64. Young man. But yeah. if I can talk about your journey, sir. Um, you were a school teacher when you I first asked, began. I asked him, like, would you change a thing? <laughs> and he just he keeps laughing about it. He's like, there's so insurmountable things that he would <laughs> So do. many things have changed. Well, let's go back to a, an earlier, happier time in your life. You were a school teacher. What would, this, if you could just talk about that a little bit. I could have stayed a school teacher. It brought him the most. It brought him the most joy. The most joy. He writes about that, I think, in his autobiography. And then at some point, you were brought into politics. Was that something you liked? You were very good at it. Kind of forced to. Kind of forced to. Family or money? All of it from different places. But he said, like, I'm feeling like he got. He was a school teacher. Then he became a principal. But you know what I mean. It was so easy for him. Uh, just a shift to from shift. one thing to the next. Right. That's what people say, people who work with you. And then at some point, you became very successful in the United States Senate, and you were considered by many to be the best speaker of the House. I think the Speaker of the Senate. Speaker of the House and the Senate. He, he was, was very, in both. And he was very articulate. And he was very, um, what's the word? Uh, he could make people. Persuasive. 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 Thank Persuasive. you. That's the word. That why, is the word. Why he also was in there, he said he was also very neutral. Like, so, like, Swiss, I want to say Switzerland. So he. Oh, neutral. Okay, very good. He persuasive, but in a neutral, giving the pros to and To see both sides of the coin. Is that correct? Yes. You're considered to be one of the best who's ever had held those roles in the Senate and in the House. And then at some point, you were floated as... So funny. He just showed me being a puppet. <laughs> oh. Well, at some point, you were floated as being uh, president. I think you were thinking of running in 1960. And the Kennedy camp family, and especially Bobby, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bobby, Robert, that you guys didn't like each other. No. Why is that? <laughs> They're kind of laughing. They both try to have each other killed. Okay, well, let's talk about that, sir. May we? Rob, Robert, are you saying that you, in some way, was trying to bump him off the ticket? Is that what you're saying? Or literally bumped off? All of it. All of it. Let's not judge it. We're just going to ask questions and see what they say. And so, LBJ, we've heard this before, but... I mean, I, we, have to, we have to categorize this, this both sides of the coin thing, because after the Kennedy assassination, after he died, after these things happened, you were an incredible supporter of civil rights. Why? Why were you an incredible supporter of civil rights? Was it the Bible? Was it your upbringing? Was it your sense of who you were? Why? It's interesting. It's nothing we can prove, but... He felt like his own, are you talking about LBJ, right? You're talking about LBJ, correct. Is it, okay, I'm getting this right. Just give me two seconds. He felt like a slave to the country, for starters. That's what he's saying. He okay. also had a puppet. He also felt like. A puppet, did you say? Slave yeah. and a puppet. Thank you. And then he said that, oh, just shut up. He was definitely some t sort of slave in a past life because he just could not. That was my next question. So, Lyndon, let's just stop for a second. Let's shift into that other lifetime. What state did you live in, if you can? 
on one second. So he just showed me, he was already going through it. So he showed me the 1600s. And he's showing me like Ireland, somewhere over there. So were you a white slave? Is that what you're saying? Or Caucasian, Irish? Yeah, he was. Okay. And that fundamentally inf affected your journey in this lifetime. All discrimination did when it came to either wealth even, like even with wealth, mm -hmm. even like discriminating against poor people. I mean, all types of discrimination he had a problem with from what I'm So saying. let's tie this back to the Kennedy family. Did you resent them on some fundamental for being rich Irish? Yes, very much so. And that related to a previous lifetime? Yes. Okay, I'm just trying to clarify. That is so weird, I have the chills. He's saying like- I do too. Almost as if he was a slave to them from some so way. So your initial reaction to the Kennedy money, to the fame, to the looks, to whatever, all of that was yeah. loathing, hatred. And they knew it, Robert knew it. But yeah. at some point, somebody, and either it was you or somebody indirectly felt that it was important to get rid of the Kennedys so that you could become the president. Is that correct? Yes. So could you? So he gave me an analogy. If a slave goes out and works in the field and gets chopped up by a, he showed me like a big tractor, like by accident, it's just an accident kind of thing. You know, the slave was doing his work or whatever it was. I don't, that's such a bad analogy. Give me well, a Well, I know what you mean. Irish indentured servants were considered slaves. They were sent to Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Indentured I didn't know servitude. that. I didn't it, know it, meaning you've been forced to work for somebody for the rest of your life and you never get out of it. What that means, but I did not under, I didn't know that Ireland, I didn't know that. Yeah, the Irish, well, I'm half Irish, I know. Um, so let's just say that's the source of this anger, even in a spiritual sense. But now let's get to the actual physicality of it. At some point, do you direct someone in your administration, including the CIA or rogue elements of the CIA, to take the Kennedys out? Or do they tell you that that's what they're going to do? How do you become aware of it? Oh, come on. Give me a second. I know when Jennifer says, oh, come on, it's bad. Well, it was bad because they showed me in a perfectly, in a situation that I was privy to information about something and didn't stop it from happening. Ah, well, that's key, please. And it's, so it's, it's, that's key. So what you're saying is that he gave you as an example, gave an example. He was aware of it and didn't stop it. That's a different thing than he created it, started it, etc. Yes. Okay. And, and is this correct? The elements involved, rogue elements of the CIA? Oh, go ahead. He said that there was a lot of, it wasn't just him. There was a lot of underground people that wanted the Kennedys gone as well. I understand. Can we just say, we, we're not going to talk to those people today, but we have mafia people like Sam Giancana, we have CIA people like uh, Howard, whatever his name was, one of the Watergate burglars. We have all these people. The book by David Talbot, uh -huh. is that accurate? Brothers, this is the name of the book? Okay, thank you. I've read the book. We've talked about the book. I know you I haven't, but it really it details it that there are these rogue elements. But the point is, at what point did you become aware of it? After it happened or before? He was aware of it during. Okay. So it wasn't during. before. Sorry? It wasn't before and it wasn't after, it was during it. He was, became aware of it. I see. I see. And who made you aware of it? Somebody in your administration? Somebody? A secretary of some sort. A secretary or some kind of a somebody. But you suspected it? And somebody then? Else. Right. 
Yes. Okay. So do you regret that, sir? He didn't necessarily regret it then, but he regrets it now. Okay. Robert, that's why I asked you to be here. Could you step forward for a second? Would you please address this question? How do you consider this information now? He just went like this and put all this dirt, like got all this dirt off and went and tackled LBJ. Like <laughs> they're like young, but younger. They were younger, like going like after. Knocked him off his ass. Asshole. Sorry. Say um, again? <laughs> he, say that what they okay. just said okay but here's me, my point robert you let's say you some version of you tap me on the shoulder maybe a year ago and asked me to come and talk to you via jennifer and you asked us to deal with this and talk about this stuff and now we're talking about it and you said it would help heal the nation to tear off the bandages you're saying is this correct that he was responsible not only for your brother's death your death, but also Marilyn Monroe's death, responsible indirectly. Is that correct? Yes. So what can we do about it? I asked Robert if he was also involved in Marilyn's death, and he too said indirectly. Wow, that's a, that's a deep question. Robert, are you aware of somebody... Go ahead. Me, either, like because of his relationship with her or because of the secrecy yeah the secrecy it would have never happened otherwise i see so he was a direct he's taken responsibility for that as well yes wow uh, mr kennedy robert are you aware of some member of your family that has been in communication with me his father is his father well, here, flip that around. Son, sorry. Thank you. That's correct. He's the father. Give me one. But... Okay, go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to ask that question. Is he aware of that? Yes. And he, he answered, yes, he is. Yes, he is. And that's why we're doing this. Because you asked us, sir. You said you wanted to talk about this. I personally would rather talk about how beautiful the afterlife is, how much fun people have, but you're asking us to rip off bandages. And I know that there's so many people invested with their own story of what happened. But LBJ, you're taking full responsibility. Are you not? Absolutely. So, and Robert, you're taking partial responsibility. Yes. Can you guys kiss and make up? They already have. They just. <laughs> well, I want to hear that. How? What was he, it like? He, what he was interested in. He goes, yeah, I'll take credit. He goes, yeah, I'll take responsibility for this lifetime. Certainly not the one before. <laughs> excellent. That's an excellent answer. Or with you know with him. Right. Whatever happened in Ireland. But. So what was it like when you guys actually connected? So LBJ, you stepped off the planet and Robert had already been off the planet and now you guys meet. What was that like? Did you understand everything or was it rage and fury? No, oh, it was love actually. He Describe just, it, please. No, the way they just made my heart sink, like, oh, we're such idiots, we did it again. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I, So you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, Wow. What? Go ahead. He just showed me leveling the playing field. That's crazy. Every time we come to a lifetime, correct me. Anybody? Martin Luther King, do you want to step in here, please, sir? Well, he did. Sorry about that. He did step in when we were talking about ripping the band aid off because that's what we're doing to the country right now. Very good. Band aid off. Leveling the playing field. Every lifetime's a field. And when we come here, we play. And some of us play better than others. Some of us play worse than others. And to level the playing field, we have to go through these things, traumas. Yeah. But can we talk about this? Martin, Robert, 
John, if you want to step in, and Lyndon. We're here to learn about compassion. Is that correct? Why we're still down here, not up there, but why we're still down here. While we're still down here, we've got the football equipment on, we got the helmets on, we got the gears, the mouth guard. We have, we're, we, need. we have everything that we need. We have everything that we need. Wow. So let's go around. Who wants to share something about their journey? So Lyndon, what about your journey would you like to share with people who might be tuning in for the first time or the last time? I should have stayed should have stayed a school teacher. I should have stayed. So just to give clarity, he was he taught Mexican children. No, you just told me that. He just said, he goes, I helped these children, the ones that needed it the most. And you showed me little dark, you know, I didn't know if it was African Americans. And you just like, you got right. That's okay. I, it's okay. We can talk at the same time. It's all right. But no, yes. No, but, but if you tell me, I can't tell you. I know, I know, I know. All oh. right. But I apologize. But oh. go ahead. Talk to, talk to us about those children. He goes, that's where I saw such a difference and what needed to be made. He's like, I knew what needed to be done to make these children's lives better. It's like helping himself in Ireland in the 1600s. Like what could he do now in the position that he's in to help somebody like him when he was, when he was serving others? What's your opinion of immigrants being held in cages? No, they're all, oh, you just brought in another, uh, well, Maverick. Oh, John McCain. Sorry. Thank you, sir. He you want to say something? Maverick, by the way. Um, I just got the chills from head to toe. Uh, hold on. He wants to sway in. He's part of the same frequency, all these guys. <laughs> oh, my God. No, say it isn't so. Indirectly, our president right now is leveling the playing field. I understand. We've talked about this. And thank you, John, for offering that. It's not that he's a good person. It's that his actions in this kind of weird, miasmic way are forcing us to address our own humanity and compassion. Is that what you're saying, sir? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Absolutely. You, you were more eloquent than most of us. And obviously different sides of the playing field if you look at these guys in this room here all from a different it's still, it's still a field it's That's still a field still a field someday it might be muddier than other times <laughs> in some it's years cool. yeah i mean we we're referring to a lifetime in the 1600s but all of us in this room including me including you we've all had lifetimes back then we've all gone through this well, so, so so McCain just said, he goes, when I was a prisoner of war, that leveled the playing field or something that happened to him before or something that he go. did. Just interesting. It is. And we've talked to him about that. And we've talked to him about, I know I asked him if he had met any of the people he had killed, Vietnamese people that, you know, before he was a prisoner of war, he'd thrown bombs down and killed people. And I asked if he had run into them on the flip side. And we also talked to him about running into some of his fellow prisoners of war, people that suffered with him. And we've talked about his counsel and how he's been given, you know, sort of stars for each journey. What, what was that laughter? He wants to come back when Trump's a kid to beat him up. Like he wants <laughs> Okay, you can do that. Oh, when he gets to the he's like, I'm coming back and Trump's gonna be this like, well, let's ask, let me ask you that, John. Based on what we understand, and Luana, if this is a correct question, allow it. If it's not. I, I, I got to just share with you what was so funny. You know dodgeball? Yeah. They're showing me hitting our president and having him, like, get so mad that that's where he just had some, you know, militia come in and just shoot us all up. Like, just, you know, <laughs> all right. But before we go down that path, John, really, John, go. If I may. Some kids don't know the rules. Okay. Some kids don't know the rules. But in terms of the construct of what we're working with here, there is a higher self of this guy. There's a higher self of all of us. Right. Have you guys run into the higher self of that guy? And have you hit him with a dodgeball? Or what's up with that? It's exhausting. It's uh, exhausting. Hold on. Aliens. 
I'm not saying that. You don't have to say it. And you know, they can't make you say it either. Well, we, we don't want to go down that. No, it's good. It's not bad. It's just that what? The, his higher self knows that he's, that's what he's doing. I see. Let's so allow that. That's what's going to happen right Let's now. try not to judge that. That is what we hear consistently in this. Even the weirdest people on the planet, their higher selves may have agreed to this weird contract. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be compassionate. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't change the system. It doesn't mean we shouldn't address the inherent systemic problems we all have. But, but here we have a chance to ask people like Robert Kennedy, what's your opinion of what's going on, sir? I'm not going to say that. Hold on. It was almost like, and I know JFK and the Bay of Pigs, he's like, it makes the Bay of Pigs look like child's play, you know? And then he goes, kind, you know, he's laughing, but he, yes, but no. Um, he says it needed to happen. Oh, that's so funny. So he showed me like, the, and it was, he, sh he showed me something that I saw how, you know, the aliens, you know, too bad the aliens just showed up and we're just like, oh, well, whatever. Here we've had <laughs> coronavirus. Right. So that'll be next. Yeah. Right after the we've cicadas blew through. Yeah. <laughs> aliens come by, we're like, whatever, you're an alien. It's like, no big deal. Like, nobody's going to care. It was just funny. Um, we're supporting everybody that hurts. That's what they're saying. All of our loved ones, everyone that hurts, they're supporting. We spoke briefly to uh, Mr. Floyd. Hold on. He said everyone can, okay, thank you. Everyone contributed to where we are now. So even the people on the other side, all the times that they hurt, you know, hurt black people, all the times that they hurt, you know, they used indentured servants or whatever you want to call it, is we've, over time, all of us are held responsible for what's happening now. I see. So in the book of human Akashic endeavors, yes. it's just another chapter, another version of how to overcome. You tell me. Robin Williams just showed up. I'm like, you tell me. Well, what was interesting is he showed everybody his lights. So everybody, that different colors of lights. And he goes, what we want to do is get to just clear colors of lights. You know, in, indirectly speaking, that we, wanna, we don't want to see different colors. We just want to, we want to get to a place where everything is beautiful, where we don't hurt each other. And we've heard that consistently in the research and our conversations that over on the flip side people see each other as lights you know and if you're white or pink or green or yellow or purple or whatever it is that is your color it's not like you would go send the purple people out of here i'm robin robin i promised somebody yesterday that if you showed up i'd ask you one question sir while you're here May I? so go ahead and ask him okay sam kinnison mm -hmm. comedian hit in a car, hit by, he was in a car accident on the way to Vegas. As he was lying on the ground, he suddenly spoke to someone as if there was an angel there. Robin, can you tell us about who that was that he was talking to? John Belushi? Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, John Belushi. Don't judge it. Don't judge it. Okay. Sam was seeing John. And Sam was saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And then the Sam said, okay, okay. Was that John saying, come on, dude, it's your time. Is that correct, Robin? Or is that a metaphor? He was even wearing his Blues Brothers outfit. Like so Sam saw John and that that's why he reacted like, no, no, hey, what are you doing here? Yeah. Okay. So and then his, 
And then he said, okay, okay, and then he passed away. I mean, that's an eyewitness report. It's in Flipside. Uh, I just, I was asked this question. Oh, I'm going to be on Coast to Coast on Tuesday the 16th. And the producer, I asked him if he had any question. He said, I'd like to know what Sam Kinison was talking about. Now we know. Thank you, sir. I, I can't take the spotlight away from Martin Luther King. Oh, we spoke to George, George Floyd last week briefly. Is there anything else he wants to say to us? He never want, okay, hold on. He never wanted the riots to become what they became. Well. Yeah, that hurt that hurt other people that should have been hurt. You were a man of peace. We know that about you. People have talked about you well, eloquently. He showed me his brother. He was right next to his brother when his brother was speaking. Like, In Congress yesterday. Yeah. He said... Oh, that's beautiful. He delivered everything that I would have wanted to say. And I could feel his pain, which hurts which reverberates all of that as well. Um, there's a lot of similarities. Hold on a second. A lot of similarities with MLK and George's brother or what the possibilities that can happen with that. Wow, beautiful. Let's not judge it. I know. George, do you want him to pick up that mantle? Do you want him to become somebody? He said that... MLK, MLK came to visit him. George, while he was still alive or just as he was crossing over? Brother. He had it, like, after this happened, I think he had a dream with MLK in it. Okay, very good. I mean, it's a very specific thing. What he's saying is that Martin Luther King visited his brother in a dream, gave him perhaps some encouragement and maybe some tools in order to speak from the heart and also so eloquently as he did. Yeah, and same with his grandmother. There's something with his grandmother. George, if I can ask you this question, you mentioned that a son was there to greet you initially and your mom you saw your mom yes he did you also saw your son and is that from your first marriage is that what that was about or was that from another girl first marriage oh someone else someone else so a miscarriage miscarriage slash termination yeah termination okay very good and we've heard this often i just want to clarify we heard it with harry dean stanton when he talked about being on the flip side and being greeted by a child. And I know in the book, uh, Backstage Past, we talk about that where I was at his memorial service and these people revealed that the last thing he said was, hand me the baby. So he saw this child and he had told us a week earlier that the child that was in the room with him was the product of a terminated or a miscarriage or whatever, a child. Always, they always know before they enter the body what's going to happen. So, always. But, but George, how old? How well, how old was your son? Was he like five or ten or? He said. That, It happened when he was 29, which feels like 14 years ago. So I think he'd be like 14 now. Okay. I mean, time is sort of, you know, relative and all that stuff. I don't know how old he was. How old but that's he how he saw him. He saw him as a young boy when he greeted him on the flip side. He recognized him instantly. He, saw some, he recognized him instantly because he was being, just like I'm being shown images, he was being shown the mother. I see. So his mom was there and his son was there to greet him. Of course she was there. I don't know even. Yeah. Well, he, he spoke clearly when he said, Mama, they're killing me. Or Mama, I can't breathe. Something like that. And, and a lot of people wrote to me and said, 
wow, that sounds like she was there. And obviously she was there. We just, yeah. we have this weird illusion. She said that she went to go get help. <laughs> oh, that's that sweet. Uh, does his mom have anything she wants to say? Something to... Very proud of her boys. And I don't know if she was here the whole time, like, meaning that I don't know. He was like a saint, from what I'm getting. Which In life. Caused, which caused, like, dis discourse between the family, just because she, hold on. It always caused a lot of fights because she would always know what was going on with the boys. Like whenever something, you know, whatever. Like two brothers bickering and she always understood without even thinking about it, what they were bickering about. Is that right? Very good. So back to um, Lyndon. We invited you here, sir, and I'm glad you showed up. What else would you like to tell people who are tuning in, who are disbelieving that this could possibly be you? We are all responsible. But that's just what came through is we are all responsible for what's going on right now. Okay. In um, your terms of your life? Everyone's lives. Everyone's lives. In oh. essence, Hold on one go second. ahead. Something with a typewriter, and it feels like there's a historical, like there's something with his typewriter that might be in a museum. I don't know, or or pen and paper, like a pencil or something like that. It yeah. might be a museum. What I about it? Well, so, let's ask him. You Are you talking him. about your museum in Houston or Dallas? Are you talking about your museum in Dallas, where I've been? Yeah. Okay. Well, I what about? And, and of course I, I would be there. Of course I would see his typewriter. What else is new? So. Did he have a typewriter in the museum? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's what, you know, he typed up his. I don't know this stuff. So he, you asked the question, what would make people know that it was him? And he said, my typewriter in the museum. I'm telling you about my typewriter in the museum. <laughs> Bing. <laughs> Bing. Ink. He couldn't stand ink. So he had, I don't know if he. I seem to remember reading something I mean, his Robert Carroll's great biography of him. There's something about ink, and I don't know if it's good or bad, or different kinds or whatever, because I'm trying to figure that out. But I think Robert Carroll mentioned that he used to do interviews when he'd sit in the bathroom, you know, the way What's-His-Face tweets. Johnson would sit in the bathroom and invite reporters in, and he would just do interviews there. And he had his own typewriter in, there, uh, in this museum at Dallas. I've only been to Dallas once. And I went to the book depository and I had this tremendously traumatic feeling for looking out the window. And I realized there's nobody here, but I felt the emotions of everybody that was there. Anyway, I'm at the museum in Dallas and there's a set that they built and his typewriter is there, you know, all of his stuff is there. And his wife is still alive, Lady Bird. Okay. Anything you want to say to Lady Bird? You're, she's got to be 90-something. She kicked ass. She kicked ass. Kicked his ass. Brilliant. She's a brilliant woman. I would have never been... And she was not indirectly knowing about all the things that happened. That happened. Yeah. So that'll be a bit of a surprise when she gets to the flip side. She's, she is the reason why he's in heaven. He's laughing about that. But <laughs> Well, let's not call it heaven. It's home. Is right. that correct, LBJ? You're home. Yes. But for those people that don't believe, like it's... That don't it's, understand what that means. You might be crappy, but your partner might get you there. <laughs> Indirectly. That's going to be like, that is going to be the funniest line ever. Indirectly. Indirectly, yeah. You're indirectly responsible, and you're indirectly not taking any responsibility. Okay, that's very good. I sure. almost the fact that he showed me a typewriter in a museum. I'm like, what? Who cares? You know, I know. I'm like, do you collect them? Because Tom Hanks does. I'm like, do you yeah. collect? Them? Well, that them? would be. I mean, I'll have to look it up. I'll post that yeah. on my blog, richmartini.com. If there is a so photograph I that I took of that typewriter, I might have it. He says that you do have it. It's black and white. There's 
Yes. I, have, I have to go, unfortunately. I know you do, but who, anybody else want to weigh in? Go ahead. Williams just came back. Please. Who are you doing tomorrow night? Coast of the coast to coast? Is it? What? So well, I'm going on Tuesday, the 16th at 10 p.m. Uh, California time. And he, uh, oh, that was John Belushi question. Hold on a second. Oh, that was with him. Hold on. Sam. Sam Kennison. Hold on. Kennison, thank you. Oh, also, so it was John Belushi, but it was also Rita. Um, uh, Charlotte Factory, Charlotte Factory. Gilda Radner. Yes. No, Gilda Radner. Okay. Is that what you meant? Rita Rudner. That was her character on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> I got it. I'm dyslexic. Okay. I saw the picture. He was there too. John and Gilda were the angels he was referring to. Yes. yes. And it was like an SNL skit, like something they might have done before. Well, Gilda, I will be happy to mention that to him. You know, technically, I don't know when Sam died. I don't know when Gilda died. I I know when John died. Your higher self is always back there. So I'm assuming it was Gilda and John. It could have been her higher self as well. Correct? No. No, it was her. Okay. No, no, I don't no. Know. I want to make sure that I got it right because my mind went crazy. Hold on. I'm just going to leave it with you because I don't know. I'll look it up. No worries. Robin? It's somebody like her on SNL. Okay. Somebody. Died of breast cancer. So I don't well, know. Well, that's all got to be Gilda. I'll have to look it up. Everybody, thank you guys for showing up today. LBJ, we appreciate you admitting your role in this fiasco and what we're living through. MLK, George Floyd, Robert Kennedy. Thank you all. Luana. Thank you for allowing us to chat with him. And Jennifer, thank you for being on the planet. And Robin Williams. And, and Robin Williams. Love, love. Thank you for knowing everything because it obviously it makes you look like I don't remember. <laughs> no, it's all good. We love you. Ciao. Bye.